and tell everybody welcome to the webinar. So let's get started with a few logistics. Um, as you know, look, we're gonna have a full hour, maybe even a bit more. We may go over a little bit. There's so much good content. We tried really hard to pare it down so we could fit within the hour, but boy, it's all good. So I'm gonna give you the first bullet and the last bullet at the same time. Uh, there will be a recording available. So if you have to cut out for another meeting or something like that, you are welcome to go do that. The recording will be available on the Imaging Analytics University website, which you can find at Image IQ's website. You can scroll forward to the part you missed and just watch, pick up from there or watch again, whatever works. Um, we will, if there is time, do questions. But what I would encourage you to do is type in questions in the question box. In your GoToWebinar um, area, you will see a question box. Um, feel free to type a question. We can collect those and then we can get back to you if we don't have time to answer them live. Okay? Um, so anytime during the webinar, feel free to, to type them and uh, we'll get those collected. Sound good? Good. Um, well, let's start with our presenters because we're going to kind of move right along. Uh, first up, Dr. Chris Blass. Thank you for being here, Chris. Appreciate it. Um, Chris is a, an associate professor at Case Western Reserve University, right? Yep. Professor of radiology. Um, his research really focuses on the development of quantitative MRI biomarkers for disease progression and therapeutic efficacy. Um, his group, based at Case, um, has developed a really novel platform for the for rapid imaging techniques that provide a whole host of MRI-based in vivo imaging. And we could probably do a whole webinar just on the work your, you and your team have done. Uh, we will touch on some of that here today, um, but that's super great. Um, you know, Chris uh, has worked with Image IQ before. He's a great friend. And honestly, Chris, thank you very much for doing this and being part of today. Uh, Glad to be here. Really appreciate it. Um, sitting next to me, and speaking of great people, is uh, one of our, uh, our other wonderful friends in our local community here, uh, Dr. Charlie Andreno, who's the manager of preclinical MRI imaging core at Lerner Research Institute inside of Cleveland Clinic. So we've got Case and the Cleveland Clinic sitting in the same room which is really a testament to the institutions really driving forward with some really interesting things here in the, in the area, which is great. Um, while, she did, while today you spend your day at MRI land, right, um, we, uh, you've been doing all sorts of research in, for well over 16 years, because you started when you were about five, yeah, right, 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 that right, worked, yeah. Right. Uh, in, uh, biomedical engineering, tissue engineering, stem cells, kidney research, um, and the story I got to tell you about Charlie, um, and I didn't do this in rehearsal because I didn't want to embarrass you, is the I first know. time I met Charlie when we started Image IQ, she said, listen, you guys are working on an experiment, and we've got to get this one right, because she had an experiment that went up in the last space shuttle mission, and I will never forget when you was like, we got to get this right, because we're not sending up another space shuttle for us, right? I'm like, okay, we got it, we got it. And that worked out really well. It was a fun study, and we've done a lot of work together. So, Charlie, and thank you very much for being here. We really thank appreciate it. Thank you for it. having me. Our third speaker is someone you've probably, if you've listened to an Image IQ webinar, heard for sure, Dr. Amit Vasanji, our Chief Technology Officer here at Image IQ. Um, he spends his days being an expert in the field of basic, preclinical, and clinical trial imaging. He's all about imaging, all about different kinds of imaging ranging from acquisition, protocol writing, analysis, visualization, and really kind of the, the um, passion that he has, which is writing software to, to get quantitative data out of images. Um, he found the Biomedical Imaging Analysis Center at Cleveland Clinic well over 15, 16 years ago, served as its director, won numerous awards for innovation and service, and as the Image IQ Chief Technology Officer, um, he really spearheads all of our um, scientific endeavors for all the work we do for all of our clients. Um, I'm going to save a little bit about Image IQ for a couple slides for now. Let's talk a little bit about what we're going to cover today. Um, the first thing you're going to learn is kind of the state of the art in research MRI. What's going on? What can we do? How does it work? Right, Charlie, you're going to cover some of that stuff. Because MRI, while the MRI scanners look a lot like CT scanners, they are fundamentally a different beast. And uh, you need to know about this stuff because it, certainly as you're doing your research and you're looking to get things through that translational gateway, getting things done in MRI and clinical trials we're discovering is a whole lot easier. Even though the price tag looks a little scary at first, when you have to deal with a translational or you have to deal with your IAB and IRBs and all that kind of stuff, things get really interesting really quick. Uh, we're going to talk about what we're capable of revealing and you're going to see some uh, really interesting examples. I mean, it's just crazy the stuff that you'll be able to see here today about what MR is capable of doing now. And honestly, from my experience, um, how quickly the imaging can be done. Because for those of you on, this, on the call, I am sure you probably thought MRI is expensive, slow, and loud, right? If you've ever had anybody who had an MRI done. And what you're going to hear from the experts today is that's not the case anymore. We've really moved things forward to an amazing uh, level of play from a cost effectiveness, time effectiveness, and, and ability to deliver that. And that's really our last bullet point. 
Uh, the webinar today is being brought to you by, so, uh, I, I like this feel like Sesame Street, the letter O and, and the number six. Um, it's being brought to you by the Cleveland Clinic Preclinical MRI Center uh, in collaboration with Case Western Reserve University, the Cleveland Clinic, University Hospitals, Renovo, uh, Neural, and Image IQ. Uh, we received a grant from the Ohio, Ohio Third Frontier grant to bring this capability to Northeast Ohio and deliver it to the marketplace. Um, and it's absolutely a wonderful, wonderful collaboration of some very good institutions and um, some commercial companies as well. Um, the Cleveland Clinic team, in this case, is housing the scanner. We're going to talk about the new scanner. Uh, Chris and his team have scanners and capability at, over a case. Uh, and then uh, the Renovo team is specializes in uh, neurological imaging, um, specializes around MS and that kind of work. Uh, Image IQ's job, who are sponsoring the webinar today, uh, is we're, we like to play the role of software analysis. So you ca capture all these images, you want to get quantitative data out of that, and we, we help you do that, whether it's in your preclinical research or your clinical trial research. So that is how we got here and all the folks that are involved in all of this. So thank you all again for being here. So at this point, I'm going to stop talking because nobody came here to listen to me, but we've got most people on the, on the thing, and we can see the number of attendees going up here as we did our introductions. So let's start with content. Charlie, I'm going to turn it over to you, and you're going to start talking a little bit about what MRI is and how it kind of works at a fundamental level, right? Great. Thank you very much, Tim. So what we're going to do here in the next couple of slides is just sort of talk about the fundamentals of MRI without going into too much detail. So what is MRI? MRI is an imaging modality that utilizes magnetic fields, radio wave energy to generate images of organs, okay? So and structures inside of the body. So what are the different components of MRI that we need to think about? Um, so the first component is, of course, our body and the hydrogen elements within the body. So within the body, MRI uses the proton, which is positively charged and has a ma magnetic spin. So mag MRI utilizes this magnetic spin property of protons to create the images. The second component of the MRI, which is the hardware component, is a strong magnetic field. So when we think of MRI, we think of magnetic fields on the order of 1.5 Tesla to 15 Tesla. So what does this mean to us in terms of, say, the magnetic field of the Earth? This is magnets that apply magnetic fields on the order of 100 times, 100,000 times greater than what the Earth's magnetic field So the is. most practical part of that is protect your credit cards. Yes. Right, because your mag strip will get wiped yes. out pretty right, quickly, right? Right, right, right. Protect your credit card. Yeah. And, you know, a limitation of MRI really is, is that if you have, like, pacemakers, there are certain patients that can't undergo MRI. So if you have pacemakers, if you have metal in your body, you know, those people would not be candidates. And then what this magnetic field does is it aligns these protons with the external magnetic field. Now, the third component uh, is the radio wave energy. So initially what's done is an external radio frequency wave perturbs these hydrogen ions and causes them to magnetize and align along the axis, okay? Once that perturbation is taken away, the nuclei start to relax and they go back to their original state. And they also emit these RF signals. These signals are then detected. They're stored in what is called K-space. They're analyzed by a very complex system in the background and converted into images. Right. All right. So, Charlie, when we're talking about this, just because I think this is important, we're going to, we, people, when you think of MRI and you think mm -hmm. of the first scanner, they talk about, well, what's the field strength, right? They talk about 1.5T. Mm -hmm. You're going to talk about, you're going to introduce your new 7T magnet, yeah. which is really cool, right? For everybody, I guess. You know, what, when, when people are looking at doing MRI, what, why is field strength relevant to them? Because that's kind of the primary thing that people talk about, right? Right, so field strength is relevant, especially when you want something with a higher spatial resolution. So as you go higher in field strength, you'll have a higher spatial resolution, okay? So, and you'll also have a higher signal to noise ratio, which means that you'll have a better looking image. Um, better contrast, uh, it also, a higher resolution, or a higher magnetic field will also allow you the capability to look at things at a much, smaller levels. So for example, example, vasculature or some of the neuroimaging that's being done now. Yeah. Um, so it's higher speed, 
higher resolution, right. higher signal to noise, and a higher right. bill. Right, and then the pre <laughs> Right, I mean, and they're more expensive, right? But is that generally true, yeah. would you oh, say, or not? Well, for small animal systems, they're about the same cost. And okay. Think, yeah. You know, so they're the same order of magnitude, maybe even a little bit cheaper. Really? So okay. a 3T human system is more expensive than a 7T small animal system. Got it, okay. So, and it's just because of the scale of what you're trying to scan. So, so for anybody out here considering MRI, one of the things that they want to do is talk to an expert. Yep. Right, right, and yep. say, okay, listen, before you just don't don't pick the loudest number, right? Don't right. don't turn it up to fifteen. I need fifteen. Right. That's I heard fifteen's a good yeah. number, right? Right. right. It, right. Just talk right. to somebody about what you're trying to image and why right. you're trying to do it to to bring that into yep. give it focus, yep. right? Is that fair? Yeah. Yep. And, and the other thing that to mention is that while it doesn't have the ionizing radiation that PT does, you do have the RF energy that you're depositing into the animal or to the human that will heat things. And, Particularly if you have a non-ferrous metallic object and there, it's going to get heated. So make sure whatever you're looking at is MRI safe, that you've tested it before it actually goes in and right. in person or an animal. Right. But Amit brings up a good point. It is non-ionizing energy. So one of the biggest advantages of MRI is that there is no limit to the number of times either a human or an animal can be imaged. Right. It can be continual. And there doesn't have to be an injectable contrast agent. Right. Yeah. Even cooler. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, talk about safety and cost and logistics. Mm -hmm. So, sweet. All right. So, when you finally have your image, what does it look like? So, what ends up happening is different tissues have different relaxation times. And because of these different relaxation times, you can differentiate between the different tissues. So the two most predominant relaxation times you have is the T1, which is a longitudinal relaxation time, and then the T2, which is a transverse relaxation time. So most of the images are created by one of these two characteristics being the predominant source of contrast. And that really depends on the pulse sequences that you're choosing, okay? So what we have here is just a quick figure to show you um, the differences between T1 and T2 and what you could expect to see. So anything, for example, like cortical bone or stones or anything that's mineral-rich tissue will have a, it have no contrast whatsoever. It will be black, all right, or dark contrast. Um, when you're looking at some of the organs, uh, cysts, you know, you have a low to intermediate uh, contrast level. So what might this be? In a T1, you know, collagenous tissues like ligaments, tendons, uh, kidneys can be picked up. You know, then you go to uh, the next level where it would be synovial fluid and cyst. The brightest components in both would be anything that has high water content and, it, for example, like fat, blood products, slow flowing blood, um, so when we show you the images over the next few slides, you know, this is what you'll be looking at. Right, and at. the important thing there to realize is it's different. If you're used to CT and thinking about x-ray and you're thinking attenuation, this isn't that, right? It's a very different kind of image, so don't make that leap or you'll get very confused. Is that fair? And it's very much a controllable contrast, so you have infinite control over playing around and tuning out to see the pathologies that you want. So it's a really... Uh, flexible technology. Right. I, the, the analogy I, I, we use here at Image IQ a lot is we talk about, you know, CT has gotten to the point where, at least in clinical trials, it's almost point and shoot. Right? I mean, you're picking a slice thickness and you're kind of done. Press go. Right? For the most part. That, that's fair. I mean, there's more detail. But when you talk about MRI, you're talking about full-on SLR cameras. Man, there, you can set lots of different things to get lots of different kinds of pictures. And that's the power of it, but it can also be a little intimidating. So, Hopefully at the end of this, maybe I should have put that on the goal slide, right? At the end of this, don't be intimidated by MR. Realize that it's a great tool that's available for all of you. Mm -hmm. So sweet. So some of the capabilities. A yeah, partial so list. some of the capabilities. So I think when people think of MRI capabilities, the majority of people think structural anatomy, T1, T2 based MRI uh, images. All right. So there's a variety of other different MRI capabilities that are available as well. So, for example, the use of contrast agents for uh, so contrast enhanced MRI or dynamic contrast enhancement. You know, these agents allow you to improve the visibility of certain body structures. All right. Then we have um, diffusion tensor imaging and arterial spin labeling and functional MRI, where you're using tissue blood flow to look at things that are abnormalities in blood vasculature and abnormalities uh, within um, the blood vessels themselves, 
Or in the case of uh, fMRI, you know, this is a functional MRI, and you're looking at changes in the brain. All right. And then, of course, you also have MR spectroscopy, which is used to interrogate the specific tissues for the presence and concentration of various metabolites. So MRI is just more than structural imaging. Very cool. All right. Oh, here's your new toy. Yes, here's our new toy. So <laughs> you guys love it. here yeah. I would like to introduce. So as Tim stated earlier, um, this so Cleveland Clinic was able to bring MRI capabilities to the clinic for preclinical studies uh, through the Ohio Third Frontier Grant. And the system that was purchased was a group of Biospec 7020. So what does this mean? So it's a system that has a magnetic field strength of seven Tesla. Our bore diameter is 20 centimeters. So in terms of scanning capabilities, what can we scan? We can scan live animals. Um, you know, we've looked at different rodent disease models, as we'll show you. Uh, our only limitation is the size of the animals. You know, we're looking at something 450 grams. Um, but we can also look at excised human and animal tissues and fluids. And where this is nice is something that Tim brought up earlier was that eventually MR can also then be done as a direct comparison to, say, histopathology or other imaging modalities. Right. And not to put too much of a commercial in on it, but at this point, it, it is incumbent for us to mention, you know, this, this facility is housed within Cleveland Clinic, has, a, has access by the local institutions here. But if any of you are interested in this and you want to you want to experiment and understand what's going on, the facility is available to outside folks. That's why the grant included the commercial folks of Renovo and Image IQ as as a conduit, so that you can come to us. We can help you, you know, run a pilot study, run something, see what's possible in your research to to take a look at this, and then you can decide how to institutionalize it, right? But this could run up through and including having your, your animals housed inside one of our local institutions and getting that done. So you have access to this as part of this grant and, and as part of the webinar, you know. So feel free to give us a ring and let us know. Right. So, all right. And, and in areas where, you know, our system is not the best system, Chris's group has a variety of yeah. uh, uh, high-end, uh, high-field strength uh, MR. I love coming to your place. It's cool. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's like it's a playground. Yeah, yes. It's, it's yes. Awesome. yes, it is. So, very cool. Well, let's start looking at some images. Okay. I mean, because at the end of the day, we're about imaging, right. so let's put some MRIs right. on the screen. So, so cool. here, so what I'm going to do is over the next few slides is show you some of the basic structural imaging that we've done over the last few months since we've acquired the system. So, what we have here is a uh, uh, mouse brain that was done post mortem. It's a T2 weighted rare uh, image. Uh, we did this at a high resolution and we did this three dimensional. So, what I want to point out here is, is uh, with MR, you can do, let's call it uh, the high end, where you're doing three-dimensional scanning. You're looking at this in all three dimensions. But what it is is a high acquisition time. So in this particular case, we've got wonderful resolution, 100 microns by 100 microns, 100 microns. Um, but it took an hour and 36 minutes. Um, but it shows us very nicely all the different features of the brain. But if somebody new came to your, your facility, you would recommend that they start off doing something like this, right? You would probably have them do some, some sort of quick, quicker scan to see what right. they're looking at and then sort of hone in on the exact. Right, right, right. So let's say, as you pointed out yesterday, this is like the Rolls Royce, mm -hmm. if you wanted to go home with this. But yes, you know, we have, uh, uh, there are different imaging modalities, such as the multi-slice, which we'll show you. So in here is another example of uh, brain structural imaging that we did, but this was a multi-slice fast acquisition. So this is also a T2 uh, rare, but in this case, we did a little lower resolution in the read and the phase, uh, in the slice and phase, but our slice thickness was one millimeter thickness, all right? So this took approximately one minute and 40 seconds for actual acquisition, right? So when you're looking for something specific, or you just want to identify structures, not necessarily quantify, going this route as a multi-slice fast acquisition would be the way to go. All right. All right. So in this case, the application that we were looking at was doing tumor lesion volumetric. Um, and we did two things for this group. Utilize the MRI data to locate the tumor and leisure and help them in the image-guided pathology analyses that they were doing. So here on the right, you have, uh, again, this was a multi-slice acquisition. We did a T2-rated rare. Uh, you have the normal brain scan, 
to your left, and then to your right is the lesion. So while we did a higher resolution in the X and Y, uh, the slice thickness was only 0.5 millimeters because really all we needed to do was one, identify for them where was it, their end goal was histopathology. All right. And so these scans took on the order. I mean, really, when you think about at least, you know, I, I, maybe I'm older than most, right? But I think of long MRI scan times. And you're talking right. about seven minutes from a right. cost and time perspective. That's a right. very practical, you know, right. imaging session, right? Right. Well, seven minutes from the sta standpoint of scanning. There is a little bit of prep work that needs to go into it. So, you know, in terms of costing this out, you would have to think more 15 minutes. Yeah. It's not like right. going through the airport scanner. Right, 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 right. 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 Cool. <laughs> but but it's, an, it's an important consideration, right? Because some of these, not all of them, but if you're just researching an animal model, you're probably not looking to apply these sequences to humans. But if you want to translate them, a patient's not going to sit, stand motionless for an hour in the, unless you put them, you know, yeah, under anesthesia, yeah. right? Right. right. You have, to, you have to make sure you're thinking about that. So. And I think one of the key features here is when you're when you're approaching a preclinical imaging study, you don't you're not forced to use a clinical protocol like you would on right. humans, which is you're trying to do a diagnosis. You need a full protocol. In an animal model, you sort of know what you're expecting, and you're going to answer one very specific question, and so it enables you to optimize that protocol down to exactly what you That's need. Awesome. So you can have a 10 minute protocol in a mouse instead of doing a full diagnostic protocol in a human. Yeah, I know I keep bringing it up, but I got to tell you, you know, from our perspective, we get that a lot. Like, oh, M R is long and it's expensive. Like it really not not in this domain. It's great. Mm -hmm. It's great. All right. So here we have another example uh, that is a combination of structural imaging and then uh, diffusion tensor imaging. All right. So this particular group has a spinal cord injury model that they're interested in eventually quantifying. So what we have to the left is the video of the spinal cord and the acquisition really. You know, only took us about two minutes, but it was to look at the general structure and to look at the white matter. Uh, where the time really came into uh, play here is looking at the DTI, which in this case, we wanted to measure the tissue integrity of the spinal cord white matter tract. All right. So in the case of the spinal cord injury, the group is interested in determining just how much of an injury and a disconnect along the spinal cord. So while we had a two-minute acquisition just to show us approximately where maybe this injury might be, the diffusion track imaging actually took eight hours and 24 minutes because of the high resolution that we did. All right. So now in terms of uh, this group, this is also a very interesting project. This is a group that's interested in looking at lung tissue characteristics especially lung volume, infiltration. They have an animal model where there's going to be edema, but they would like to track treatment efficacy, all right? So in this case, we're using some, uh, a uh, uh, sequence called the ultra short echo time. Um, and as you can see, we're getting very nice quality in terms of the lung space uh, and at a pretty good resolution. And it only took about 32 minutes to scan the animal, all right? And again, these are multi-slice acquisitions. All right, so one of the final images that I want to show you that we've done is sort of the kidney abdominal structural imaging. Um, and this is a group that's eventually interested in looking to see uh, differences that are occurring in the kidney. Um, but, oh, no. go back. Sorry, I hit the wrong go button. Um, <laughs> So as you can see, you know, we have really nice structural features of the uh, uh, rat abdomen and uh, the uh, kidneys themselves. And this was a T1 rare. Um, but as we're going through the video, I'd also like to point out, you know, just how nice you can we see nice spinal features. We see nice abdominal features. And again, you know, this acquisition only took about two minutes. And it really depends what you're looking at. But for something like this, and maybe you could, uh, you know, comment on this. When you're looking at something of a slice thickness of one millimeter or 0.5 millimeters at this resolution, you know, targeting trying to quantify a lesion or a tumor, this should be more than adequate. 
in the right. so image analysis. Yeah, it's, it's a good point. It, it really depends on what you want to assess, right? If you want to know what the volume of the tumor is, you probably want to do a 3D acquisition. Mm -hmm. But if you want to see what the contents of the tumor are, is, you probably can get away with a, a bigger slice thickness and very high quality in plane image uh, resolution. So you get the ultra structure, structural um, information from it. So, you know, it's, and it's another good point too is that this is where it sort of differs from the CT. You can actually choose which view you're looking at or how you're acquiring your images. Right. Like DC, you can only go in one direction and you reformat your plans. Here, you can choose which orientation you actually have to do the acquisition. So you have a lot more flexibility here um, in picking the good, a good plane to do analysis. Very cool. All right, Fred, you go first next? Yes, oh, go ahead. All right, I'm present next. <laughs> All right. Um, so one of the final images that we did was this is a diffusion tensor imaging, uh, which again, it measures tissue integrity. And in this particular application, it was to look at the tissue integrity of the brain, you know, specifically in applications like tumor infiltration, cardiac infarction, connectivity, stroke, um, different demyelinating diseases like MS. Uh, and what this actually does, again, this is a very high resolution scan, but for white brain matter, when there's a disruption, using something like DTI allows you to actually measure where the breakdown of the tissue is and the integrity and what these different disease states are uh, affecting. Now, you know, this is at a very high resolution again, but it provides a lot of information in the end. So would you do this in a live animal under isoflurane? So, I, you know what, if we were to do this in a live animal, and Chris can probably <laughs> talk more to this, we would not do it for 12 hours. Okay. We would have to come up with a much lower resolution type of a DTI, which has been done, and find something that's sort of a middle ground and runs less than an hour. So what's really interesting is in, in the current state of the art in human MRI is these kinds of resolutions, they're now, at least on this order of magnitude, they're now pulling off with the whole connectome issues or initiative. And, and so these kind of sub-millimeter uh, resolutions in humans, they're doing right. now, right now with DTI acquisitions through, through really advanced in hardware, parallel imaging, and, and, a, and a variety of, you know, sparse acquisition strategies. It's, it's pretty amazing what they're able to pull off now in humans. That is spectacular. All right. So. Next part of our story is a little bit about you know quantitative clinical and preclinical MR. So Chris, I think we're turning this one over to you. All right. So um, so Charlie's shown you a little bit about um, the structural imaging and, and how it can help guide you from from an MRI perspective. Um, what I'm going to talk about now is is really about quantification in MR. And in, and we think about preclinical world quantification is everything because in the preclinical world we're not so much interested in whether or not yes this this animal has disease or no, it doesn't have disease. You're interested in finding out what is the extent of the disease and the extent of therapeutic efficacy. So it's a really very different question. But quantitative MR over the past five years has also become important on the clinical side. And, and it's looking at more like markers for disease, early disease detection and progression and it also as response to therapy. I'd say five years ago, quantitative MR in the, in the clinical world was, was just sort of talked about. You know, but now it's become sort of mainstream, and, and I'll show you some of these things that are going on in our group and elsewhere. Um, but on the preclinical side, it's a very different approach. Again, it, it's a hallmark for what we do in all preclinical research now. We want to be able to quantify the disease from a different perspective, and we want to investigate different disease mechanisms. We want to look at molecular imaging agents. How do we see the disease at a very, very, very early time point? And we also want to validate these image markers with histology. Again, don't want to do this in humans, so we want to be able to validate an animal model so that we know exactly what the imaging information is giving to us so that we can then translate that onto humans. This is a really important feature. And so what you see at the bottom of this slide is a couple of pictures. It's a human scanner, and it's an, and it's an animal MRI scanner. And really that arrow in between goes back and forth both ways. And this is important because the clinic has to advise what we do on the preclinical side, but we learn so much on the preclinical side that we can drive upward as well. It's not a one-way street. But this is an important takeaway. So really, to be able to do this, to translate, to, to generate information on the preclinical side and, and translate up, we need quantifiable imaging data. And from an MRI perspective, this is challenging. And I'll leave you with it. So the structural images that Charlie has shown you and all the diagnostic MRI data that you've seen in the past is really non quantitative by nature. It's very structurally determined. It's more like, mm, yes, I see something, or no, I don't see something. The, what, the transformation now is to make it quantifiable 
by definition. So, so I'm going to leave you with a few things here. So this is what I'm showing here at the bottom is a typical anatomic image of a, of a, a cystic fibrosis patient lungs. And so in this, you can see some of the vasculature, which is showing up in white, and you see the airways, which are kind of darker here, and that's the lung parenchyma as well. It's, it's, it's non-quantitative by nature. Again, it, the voxels here are grayscale. They don't represent a real number. Um, and in the clinic, quantification is important and becoming more and more important, but diagnostic MR is still the lead here in the clinic. And again, to kind of contrast that with CT, for anybody on the line who's familiar with CT, you know, you've got this concept of the Hounsfield unit, right? And that means something, right? right? And that's always been one of the challenges of MR, depending on what machine you're on, you're getting different numbers, right? And, and, and the goal here is to try to get out of that phase and get into the right. quantitative data. Right. It's, it's, it's changing the mindset entirely about what MR should be, right? right? And so... And so what I'm going to show you here, again, is to break down that paradigm. It's like in, most people think of MRI as not being quantitative. I'm showing you here um, a T1 relaxation time map of the same patient's lungs. And I'm going to show you in a minute how we acquired this data and, and the benefit of acquiring this data in, in our uh, clinical trial that we're running. But again, instead of having just a structural image, which you see on the left, we have what looks a little bit grainier on the right, but it's real quantitative. So every pixel in that image is it represents the T1 relaxation time in the tissue. And we're going to show you in a second what this really, how this really plays out. But again, I'm going to break down this paradigm that MR is not quantitative or can't be quantitative. So, so the, the bar chart what we're showing here is, is, a, is a set of cohorts that we're doing and comparing the lungs of cystic fibrosis patients in yellow versus our healthy control subjects. And these are all age match controls. And so if we look at these T1 maps in different regions, all right, so the UR and the UL at the bottom are the upper regions of the right and left lungs, and the LR and the LL at the bottom are the lower regions of the right and left lungs. And we saw for the CF patients that both in the upper and lower lungs, these, these T1 times were, were statistically and quite a bit dramatically lower for the CF patients in comparison to the controls. And again, a p-value of point, less than 0.001 here. Um, and again, there were also a difference in the uh, lower lung regions as well, like I said. What's, what's really important from this takeaway here are two things. One, these two groups had no difference on spirometry. So what that means is, even though the CF patients have disease, their lung function, the clinical standard lung function assessment is spirometry. And these CF patients had exactly the same lung function in this clinical standard. We put them under our MRI scanner, and we see huge differences. This is a big deal. Okay, great. All right, so spirometry costs 100 bucks and MR costs 3000 Why should I do this? All right, let's address it. And, and so you think of MR being expensive. Well, that's under the old paradigm of taking an hour to acquire your data. In this stuff, in this study, we were acquiring these T1 maps in five seconds per imaging slice. That's so accurate. It, it changes everything. So you sit in there and you, and you instruct the patient, hold your breath, five seconds later, out pops a T1 map. That's your definitive that's a, answer. That's amazing. Because I mean, you always used to think breath hold was like the, the standard for cardiac CT or you know pulmonary CT. And now to think about breath hold in MR, it's, a, it's, a, it's amazing. Right. It's so it, it shows that you can do this in an effective manner in a clinical setting that's both economically viable and also adds something to the patient care. Now, to be fair, if you are if you're any of you are thinking about doing this in your clinical trial, Go into your PI site and say, hey, could you please pull up the protocol that does the five-second T1 mapping? They're probably going to look at you like you're crazy because this is not a standard of care kind of thing. The hardware in, in the field is capable of doing it, but you're going to need to work with someone like Chris or Charlie or Amit, and, and you're going to have to work with someone to get the protocols right on that scanner, right? Is that, that, I think that's a fair thing, right? I, I think ask for this. I think that's fair to say absolutely right now. Today, and, yeah, I, and I would say, and I would also say, too, that it, if, if you were to buy an MRI, clinical MRI scanner tomorrow, it will have this T1 mapping capability on it. Got it. Got and it. So the capabilities to do this, the acquisition strategies are absolutely 10, 20 years old. But now they are actually becoming so important in clinical care that these strategies are going to be on every modern MRI scanner. So if you were going to conduct this as a longitudinal study, how hard is it to actually align the slices from time point to time point so that you guys are getting the same sort of area of interest? It is challenging, um, but you certainly have to you have to use a little bit of insight and you have to use anatomic references, reference points as, as where you're going. And then from our perspective, what we do here is we acquire multiple slices along here so okay five seconds per slice okay so let's acquire seven eight slices sure okay so now we're up to two minutes total acquisition time 
so like so you're getting you know three dimensional coverage over the lungs by just acquiring multiple slices so it takes away a little bit of that effect okay. so you can see uh, some minutiae in there and again but you're looking for different features and again what we wanted to see here is can we see the chronic effects of cf lung disease and the data is like unequivocal it's right there so I've showed you a little bit about how we use quantitative MR data in the clinic. This is about preclinical MR data and what we want to do. So obesity and diabetes is a major issue for humans. Uh, it's an epidemic worldwide. It's not just the Western world anymore. Um, so one of the things that we've been studying at CASE is a variety of different animal models of obesity and both dietary and genetic and different molecular therapies along, the, along those lines. And so what we developed is for this is a quantitative way of assessing obesity. So we wanted to look at adipose tissue volume biodistribution. And so we come up with this technique called relaxation compensated fat fraction MR. And it's really based on the ideal technique developed by the Scott Readers group over in Wisconsin. But we adapted it to our MR group and also put in some image analysis capabilities so we could, in a very reasonable amount of time, acquire high resolution fat water images, which are kind of showing here in B and C in the middle. And also then take that in like in column D and classify those different tissue compartments so that we can measure the adipose tissue volumes. And so if you just look at the subcutaneous compartment, we see high fat and low fat dietary mouse models. And we see really big differences between those two groups, both in, again, in, both in subcutaneous as well as peritoneal adipose tissue volumes. And again, we've applied this for a variety of different techniques. We probably use this, this particular capability, I don't know, maybe about a 500 to 1,000 times over the past five, six, seven years. Uh, so it's a, kind of a hallmark for what we want to do. And just looking at this biodistribution, and really the, the alternative here is to sacrifice the animal and excise tissues and do weights, which is you can't track longitudinal studies. You can't do developmental studies. There's It, may, it makes it very complicated. You bring up a good point, though, because that, that's one of the maybe the subtleties of when you talk about the cost of preclinical MR versus not, right? When you're doing MR and you don't have to sacrifice the animal, you have a smaller cohort, not to mention the ethical, you know, good feeling that you get and, and benefit that you have, but you can actually do a longitudinal study without sacrificing the animal and, and make those kinds of measurements. And that does reduce overall cost, even though the imaging component might be a little more expensive. Well, it's right? supposed to have your money downstream too, because if you're using MRI to scout your, your, your animal, you can actually target where you do your histology. Otherwise, you're slicing and dicing the entire mouse and not knowing where to look. Oh, that's yeah. yeah. And what I'm going to show you on the, on the next slide actually takes that that same discussion a step further. So, with the same technique, we can measure hepatic fat fractions. So, obesity leads to um, hepatic steatosis, which then leads on to steatohepatitis and liver fibrosis and even hepatocellular carcinoma. Um, but again, comparing these two different cohorts here, sort of the, the low-fat diet mice are in red, where the high-fat diet-fed mice are in blue. And again, these are the exact same strain of mice, practically the same litter mates. Um, and, and so they're about as close as you're going to get in terms of repeatability. But if you look at their hepatic fat fraction distributions as a cohort, they are completely different. And so if you look at the high fat group or the high fat fed group in blue, you see this wide range of hepatic fat fractions. And again, these are the same genetics. This is the same expression. This is the same environments growing up. And, and, and yet the, the hepatic fat levels are varying anyway from 10% up to 30% in these animal models, while the lean animals almost exclusively show zero level of hepatic fat. Again, it shows you what the value add. If you did this by traditional measures, that variation that you're getting in that high fat group is really going to bother you. But the fact that you can do this in a longitudinal fashion really opens up some opportunities to study this in a more detailed uh, fashion. Chris, I'm going to ask you a quick question because one of our folks asked a question. I thought sure. we just dropped in here because I think it's a, a relatively easy one. It says, uh, can you differentiate between brown and white fat? Absolutely. Okay. So that's, that's a great one. So there's multiple ways to go at that, and I'll give you the 30-second uh, answer to that one. Um, so there's, a, a, there's, there's something called zero quantum coherence uh, MRI, which is a really fancy technique, but it's a really cool physics-y technique, and I won't over-nerd it today. Um, but... It's, it's a really fun technique, and you can see different signatures between brown and white fat. Um, and it's an active area of research, by the way. So um, there's a group in North Carolina and a few others that do some really spectacular stuff here. It's also interesting because the, it's, it actually is the brown fat turns up as a bit of an artifact in pet studies. So it shows up as a bright spot that hinders some of the other things that are going on, and especially in pediatric patients. So it actually becomes a hindrance. 
but this sort of metabolic information or metabolic differences going on between brown and white fat are very, very critical. And there's also a, a, some effort going on now using some of the diffusion MRI techniques to differentiate because, you know, the adipocytes are structured different in those two different components as well. So there's a lot of things here. I'll put it that way. Great. Well, thanks for the question. And like I said, if you have any other questions, feel free to type them in. We'll try to get them worked in either in, in, in this or afterwards, but keep on rocking. Absolutely. Um, so one of the things that, that we found when we, when we first got our preclinical MRI scanners back in 2005 is, you know, we wanted to do all this quantification because, again, that's what that's bread and butter for biological science. And so how do we generate bar graphs for our, for our collaborators that we want to be able to generate? Well, okay, so let's go in and we need quantitative data. Well, there's a problem here. And, and one of them is the standard that we use a lot in, in the clinic as well as these preclinical systems, even some of the stuff that Charlie has shown you here, is the spin echo acquisition, which can be anywhere from 10 minutes to 30 minutes, um, depending on the resolution and the signal capabilities that you need. So it, it's, it's a longer acquisition, but and it's not too long by itself. But again, that's one image set, and that one image set by itself is non-quantitative. Now, to make that quantitative, you have to acquire four, five, six of these different spin echo acquisitions. Now that, that bumps you out to, oh no, now you're talking two to three hours. It's not good in the clinic, and it's certainly not good in a mouse study where you know it can be expensive to do in comparison to pathology. So how do you approach this, and how do you do something that's effective? Well, in the clinic, there are a few really fast acquisitions that are used routinely on low field MRI systems, so 1.5 Tesla and 3 Tesla. And so a couple of examples I'm showing here, one is TrueFist, and the other is EPI, or echo planar imaging. And what's really interesting is when you apply these to high field MRI systems for preclinical applications, you end up with some pretty severe artifacts. And so TrueFist, you get these nasty banding artifacts, these dark bands that you see in the middle of the mouse brain here. Um, an EPI can give you a variety of artifacts. You get well-known ghosting artifacts. You also get image distortion. So if you look at the mouse brain on the bottom, it's kind of distorted up to the one side here. And this is actually a good EPI image, if you can think of it. So you can go really slow and get good quality in spin echo, or you can go really fast and in like one second get images, but they're artifacted. That's not good. That was the state of art where we got into this about, you know, about 10 years ago. So what my group has done is realized that there's sort of a variant of TrueFist called FIST. So it's, and I won't get into any details here, but it's just as fast. You lose a bit, a little bit of SNR in terms of about, you know, about 30% of your signal, but you end up with good quality and you don't end up with any of those bending or, or distortion artifacts. So it's fast, reasonable SNR, and, and, and so you have this opportunity. So our goal was to see if we could sort of flip this out into a platform of capabilities that we provide a variety of those techniques that Charlie alluded to in the beginning. And we've done that. And so we've developed the chemical exchange saturation capability of uh, this technique, uh, which is similar to magnetization transfer. We developed the diffusion uh, FIST technique as well, and we got T1 and ASL methods as well. And, and so what we've done is taken this essentially and developed a magnetization preparation component and then tag it to the FIST acquisition. And so that, that preparation could be any of these different type of MR quantification methods. And then you just have this really rapid, robust technique right at the end just to do it as an imaging readout. And again, the FIST technique gives you images in less than a second, no artifacts like I showed you for EPI and true FIST. And it has high SNR per time in comparison to even spin echo acquisitions, the, the bread and butter of all MR. And so you know, our, we're about a factor of 16 improvement in SNR per time, even though the absolute SNR is actually quite a bit lower. Oh, a bit. Right. So, so, but again, it's flexible for multiple applications. So we've been very successful in doing this. So I just want to show you some of these examples and, and walk through some of this. So what you're looking at here is the PCK rat model of congenital hepatic fibrosis. And, and one of the things that this rat model gets is, is both fibrosis as well as hepatobiliary dilatation. And so if you look at the T1 maps here, as you go from left to right, it's the SD is the Sprague Dolly control rat and the PCK rat model that has uh, fibrosis in the middle, and then a more a very severe PCK rat with cholangitis infection over on the far right here. And once again, what's really important is you're seeing these T1 maps, which were acquired in vivo in, in a matter of minutes, whereas the trichrome stain, the, the, the histology that we did on the same rat livers is shown on the bottom. And what's, again, 
go back to the very beginning. What's the benefit of what we're trying to do here? So like, okay, so we can see these differences in T1 maps with the specific different disease models, but now we can go back and truly validate these techniques in histology and truly understand what the imaging data is telling us. It's not just about like, hey, I see a difference. I see this difference. And in this case, the T1 maps the T1 values in the PCK rat are actually elevated. And that's not from the fibrosis, that's from the hepatobiliary dilatation, okay? And this is really important. So it's, it's the increased T1 value that Charlie talked to you about, the fluids in the bile ducts. That's the difference that you're seeing here. And that's what we see in histology too. The, the blue is showing the fibrosis, but the hepatobiliary dilatation is shown with these sort of enlarged white nodules within the trichrome stains as well. And again, as we look at this, we did this validation in comparison to three different markers of histology just to make sure that we exactly know what we're talking about with this model. It relates to percent bile duct area. Again, that's the hepatobiliary dilatation. We see that differentiation. It relates to percent fibrosis scores um, in, as well. So even though we're not directly measuring it, we see that the hepatobiliary dilatation tracks with fibrosis, and that's just as important here. And again, the third one on the bottom is hydroxyproline content, which is a measure of collagen. That lines up as well. So we, like, we walked away with three different histological measures to tell us exactly, hey, look, I can do a T1 map in this mouse model, and now I can take that to patients with congenital hepatic fibrosis. Again, thinking back to the CF study I showed you earlier, that's a five-second scan that I now have confidence that I can do this in a two-year-old ARPKD patient. So, And it speaks back to the... Um, argument against doing histology through an entire organ because that can be expensive and um, if you are ever doing histology it'll probably take you months to do whereas you can quickly get an answer in a few seconds right, right. right. yeah well yeah how, how long have we heard about histology wait time getting your data back right, right? I mean right. it's measured in weeks and right. months right some cases but you need to validate just like you need to validate it right but no that's, that's a great point yeah. So we've taken this T1 methodology as well, and we used it dynamically to track contrast agents. We're working with Suzanne Brady County, who is in the Department of Molecular Biology at Case, and she's developed an uh, uh, MRI contrast agent that's, that has a peptide targeting uh, that's really targeted to the, the, that peptide within tumors, within brain tumors. And here we're showing a xenograft model of these different tumors. But what this quantification gives you is something very different than people that may have been, have some familiarity with DCE MRI techniques where you look at the signal go up and then come back down again as the contrast agent washes out. And, the, and in those studies, which are sort of pseudo quantitative, I'll call it, you, you look at the profile, the signal intensity, but individual points within that profile are not quantitative by nature. It's all relative. And here we're measuring the T1 time dynamically. So each data point in these curves is an absolute value. And what we wanted to see here is if we compare this targeted MRI contrast agent with our scrambled peptide, which is as a control, as well as a non-targeted clinical agent, what we see is in the dark blue here plot, we see that the T1 starts off in uh, pre-injection around one. This is all normalized to our pre-injection point in the tumor. And after we inject it, we see that the targeted agent all the agents drop down to some lower T1 value as we'd expect from a gadolinium contrast agent. What's really interesting from the peptide target agent in dark blue is that that T1 reduction is sustained because that agent is bound to the tissue because of this peptide binding. And we can see quantitatively and objectively that after about 25 or 30 minutes, we know for sure that there is real binding going on in that in that region based on it's not just being washed in and then washed out again. We see real binding going on within that tumor. So again, it gives us a really good idea what the real kinetics are within that tumor. So it's really kind of fun. Um, we've also developed an ASL FIF technique. And for those not familiar, ASL stands for arterial spin labeling. It's basically a non-contrast perfusion technique. And, it, and it's really important for diabetics and different chronic kidney disease models because gadolinium is just uh, is a contraindicated for a lot of patients that have advanced kidney disease. So having this ASL capability for non-contrast perfusion is something that's really important. So um, what we did, we developed this technique as well so we can get quantitative perfusion assessments in mLs per minute per 100 grams of tissue. And here we're just showing images of a control on the top, a control mouse brain on the top, and a, and a and a stroke model on the bottom, and on on the far on the left side of the of the image, 
you see the infarct that's been generated from this purposeful occlusion model. And what's really interesting is we even see in this one, this occlusion and the stroke is so, so severe that the edema is actually forcing drops in perfusion on the contralateral side is, is what we see in this one. So again, this, this technique sees the perfusion, but we also see different features here that you, again, and to go back to Amit and, and Tim's comments from the very beginning, this is stuff that you can't do by histology. You can't measure that functionality in vivo. This gives you an insight to what's really going on. And we've taken this model and looked at blood-brain barrier integrity and a variety of different studies as well. So it gives you a really good idea of what that in vivo physiology or pathophysiology is as well. So the last thing I'm going to talk about is something that came out of the the clinical MRI research group at CASE led by Mark Griswold, Picasculani, and Nicole Cyberlich. It's called something called MR fingerprinting. And this is this is kind of fun stuff. No, I'll say it's very fun stuff. Um, it's, it's a wholly different way to do MR and do MR quantification. The, the T1 and perfusion and, and diffusion stuff that I've showed you just previously are all based on acquiring your MRI images and using some sort of block model to to do a least squares fit to the data. Well, this is a very different approach. And what, and what they've done here is, is take the ability to acquire images very rapidly. So on the order of 20 milliseconds per image. And so extremely rapid acquisitions. And if you look at this image progression, every one of those images looks very different. It's the same imaging slice, but what you're doing during this dynamic acquisition is you're adaptively changing the MRI acquisition parameters over time. And so what I'm talking about here is acquiring maybe two to three to four thousand images dynamically, all with different variations of those acquisition parameters, acquired all within maybe 20 or 30 seconds. So you're acquiring thousands of images really quickly. And you can talk about big data. This is big data 101. Yeah. And so what's really interesting here is since you know what those MR acquisition parameters are a priori, you're, you put that in there. It's not random. You're telling it exactly what to do over time. What we know is because of the block equations that derive all of the signal evolutions in MRI, you can model those equations as well. Okay. And so what we do, if you think about one voxel, this would be the signal evolution profile here in blue from, from every voxel. Every voxel is going to be a little bit different. All right. And that evolution profile really is determined by the block equation, and that block equation impacted by the diffusivity, the T1 time, the T2 time, the perfusion, the content of the tissue, a variety of different components. And so then because we can model this with those block equations, we can set up a database or a dictionary for every possible physically realizable condition of those parameters. So every possible T1 value, every possible T2 value. So let's say we have on the order of somewhere between 20,000 and 100,000 different profiles for every voxel. And what you do is say like, okay, this pixel that we acquired is shown here in the big pane here on the, uh, on the left at the top. Well, we're going to say, all right, we see that that voxel closely matches what this set in our dictionary. And guess what? Just like the fingerprinting database where you're looking for that match, right? right? Yeah. Then this is where the fingerprinting component comes. You're just saying, oh, this is pretty close to that. And from there, you get T1, T2, proton density, diffusion, and all the other components that might be important to doing quantification. Again, what's really important here, too, is just like you do in your fingerprint for Homeland Security, you don't need a full fingerprint to get a match. Right. Uh, yeah. You don't need a full MRI fingerprint to get quantification. And this is really important because that's a really huge advantage in comparison to doing some of those traditional ways of doing quantification by MR. Hmm. So, so we've taken this technology and, and now applied it on preclinical systems. And again, I've shown you some of the dictionary parameters here, the, the ranges of our T1 and T2 values that we put in. And I'm showing you some of the parameters that we're changing. I'm changing flip angle and I'm changing repetition time. Over time, over 600 images that we're going to acquire this. And again, we take that, those a priori known profiles, put them into our block simulators, and create a set of dictionary profiles. Again, this is, you know, a on our case, almost 20,000 different profiles we could have possible from different T1 and T2 values, all right? And so what does this give us? And so what we're doing right now with this is a variety of different applications. We're looking in the lung, we're looking in the heart, we're looking in the brain. Um, and what I'm showing you here is T1, T2, and proton density maps of 
two different mouse models of glioma. And what's really interesting is, is these two different mouse models, the GLE36 tumors and also the CNS1 tumors, have very different properties where it comes to invasion and tumor migration. So the GLE36 tumor will, once it's been implanted, will just grow into a sort of nice ball, but it will never, ever migrate along vessels or along white matter, white matter tracks. The CNS1 tumor, on the other hand, looks completely different. It'll start migrating immediately. and It'll start branching out into various regions of the brain, so it's highly invasive. And so what's really interesting is we have we see in our fingerprinting data, because we generate these T1, T2, and proton density maps simultaneously, we get three bits of information. And what we're seeing is three, is two different signatures between these two different tumor types. And we're doing this in, in both humans as well as in animal models. And again, the animal models gives us the chance to sort of tease out what we're seeing here. Is it the true invasion? What is going on here? And we want to couple this again with some of our targeted MRI contrast agents to feed forward even more into what's going on at the molecular level. Super cool. Well, Chris, thanks very much, Amit. I think you've got a couple more things to do. And as we kind of warned you at the beginning, we're going to run right up to the top of the hour. But we've got a few more examples for you. And maybe you're going to bring us home here, and then we'll uh, we'll let you uh, all escape into the next part of your day. Yeah, I'll just cover a few examples of um, MRI sequences and techniques we're using in terms of analysis for clinical trials. And these are ongoing clinical trials. Um, the unfortunate thing is for most clinical trials, they're using MRI as a most mostly a safety mechanism. Um, they're not using it for quantification. They're, they're, and which is a shame because it costs a lot of money to take these MRIs. Like for this, for this particular example, for polycystic kidney disease, um, the, the primary endpoint is actually GFR. So they're looking at lab data. They're not looking at the, the actual MRI. So you can actually see the cysts that are formed for these patients pretty easily in an MRI. Um, so we took a, a set of these and actually started doing analysis on them and, and staging the disease and staging treatments and things like that are happening in therapies and looking at outcomes in terms of volumes of these cysts um, over multiple time points. You can track them. You can see how big or small they get. You can count the numbers of them. You can also take multiple sequences, register them, and actually look at um, other um, uh, structures such as the outline of the kidney. So you're looking at both simultaneously in the in the same scan, and these are all patient scans. So, so all the data that you see on the left, you get for every single patient, every single time point. Um, you can also look at um, functional data within the MRI too. So in this particular case, you're looking at uh, health of cartilage. Um, this is an ongoing trial that we have um, looking at cartilage defects and how healthy the, um, the, um, the graft is that they put into the, um, the, the patient. So um, you can see a sort of a map there. This is just a T2 sequence that you apply um, using a, um, a, a using a, a phantom-based um, technique, where you can see based on the orientation of uh, collagen within your cartilage how healthy or how striated it is based on um, the orientation of the, um, the, the the collagen in your in your your your, your graft. So um, as, as long as you have healthy cartilage, it's it's going to be striated. If you do the uh, traditional sort of microfracture te techniques, you'll get a, a block of cartilage that's not striated, and eventually will sort of just come up with a, um, the surface of the, the knee. So um, this is, is important sort of to, to understand is that even though you can do t uh, T2 mapping in pretty much any MRI machine, there are various numbers of knobs and buttons and different, M different manufacturers. So Philips has a lot of them. Siemens has very few of them. So you have to know what to adjust. And the lengths of scan times are actually different for each of these as well. Right. So, and that goes back to what Charlie and Chris said earlier, which is, you know, like, okay, so you think about CT as kind of point and shoot, and MR is kind of the complex SLR camera, right? There's so many ways you can you can utilize the tool. Right. You've got, you, you need to just make sure you've got a protocol, especially in the clinical trial space, because, you know, what is, what's the rule, right? It's like uh, the real estate thing, location, location, location. And in clinical trials, it's enrollment, 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 right? And, and you don't want to have a conversation that says, I can't enroll a patient because the scanner's not capable of images. You got to just be careful with that because you don't want to lose subjects in, in your in your trial because you've got a, a, a protocol problem effectively. So right. That, that's, a, that's a little bit tricky in the in the broad universe of all the scanners out there. Right, right. And if you, and you, if you do have five or six or four or five vendors within your study, you have to make sure that you're generating data that you can compare across sites. So using things like a phantom, uh, making sure you have a physicist on staff that actually is looking at some of the scans that are coming out of your Well, okay. Well, so let's, let's put this on the table here, right? Because that's one of the other cool things about MRI and clinical trials. Healthy volunteer. 
right? There's no healthy volunteers getting in CT scanners to be calibrated, right? Or or phantoms. But in MR, you know, you do have that ability to actually put someone. I mean, if they got to go through the MR process, but it's it's yeah, it, it, it's much it's better that we've learned the hard way is that uh, in at most of these sites. Be very careful. They're not going to use patient scanners at these sites. They'll use research scanners, which aren't necessarily accredited. So make sure that you have somebody that's healthy that goes into the scanner and have somebody look at it. Right. And if there's no artifacts or if things in the um, image that will cause an issue for analysis or a scoring. Right. Um, the last thing I wanted to show you is it's something that you can actually do on um, a, a patient scan, but it actually takes a long time. So. The, with a traditional T1 sequence, you can see structures in the brain, but they're very hard to delineate because uh, the, um, the transition between white and gray matter and different structures in the brain is not really that clear, especially if you're not doing a really high resolution sequence. So um, there are techniques out there where you can take a, a structure of a brain, strip out the skull, and then register an atlas to the actual brain and then tease out the different structures here. So they're all listed on the bottom here, but you can quantify what they are. It, it's going to take a long time. It takes up on the order of five to ten hours per per brain, but um, eventually you'll get all of this data that actually is going to be pretty useful in terms of looking at um, these, these structures and how they're changing for different diseases. It's, it's also I mean, one of the one of the key motivating factors in doing this quantitative yeah. fingerprinting work is then with those real quantitative numbers, it speeds up this process right. immensely. Right. Right. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, that's a good point. Very cool. All right. We made it. It's just an hour, an hour and 30. It's just after the top of the hour. So I'll tell you what, we're going to pause on questions uh, and stuff like this. Chris, Charlie, and then thank you very much. Um, all of you who attended, thank you for uh, joining us. Um, you know, one of the things I'm always amazed by is the number of people who stay to the end of these. Um, and uh, it, it's just been incredible. So hopefully that means you found it valuable, you found it interesting. If you have any questions, um, feel free to visit us, you know, the Image IQ website, you know, certainly you can visit the, the Case and the Cleveland Clinic websites for, for their information. We're happy to um, talk to you about what you want to do, help you figure out what you're doing in your research and, and bring some of these really cool technologies and, and techniques that everybody's doing all this wonderful work on uh, to your research. And that's kind of the exciting part about why we're doing this today. So thank you all very much for being here. And uh, everybody have a wonderful day and we'll uh, hopefully find you on the next webinar.